c'est vrai que l'informatique est une arme de destruction massive. C'était une arme de distraction massive, mais c'est une arme de destruction massive aussi. Et il euh, n'y a aucun doute que... Et quand on l'empêche de marcher, et là les civils peuvent en pâtir si on détruit le système de santé, les systèmes d'information, d'hôpitaux, d'imagerie de, de, médicale, euh, c'est une arme, donc, euh, quand on, on, on l'empêche de marcher, on la détruit. C'est une, une arme quand on, on espionne, c'est une arme quand on détourne. Tu as mentionné les drones et les, et les robots, euh, ce qu'on appelle les robots létaux, mais c'est vrai que si on détourne le, et on pirate leur informatique, on peut les faire se retourner contre nous et faire en sorte que les drones nous reviennent sur la figure, si je peux comme « come back to us ». Donc, il y, a, il y a effectivement dans la dans l'informatique, de quoi se faire beaucoup de, de, de soucis. Euh, et on le voit, de, euh, on voit les prémices aujourd'hui avec simplement le fait de, 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 de l'espionnage. Euh, comme disait Obama, enfin, on faisait dire Obama, ce n'était pas « yes, we can », mais c'est « yes, we scan ». Bon. Donc euh, la discussion est, est ouverte maintenant. Je pense qu'on va peut-être l'étendre à, à ce que tu as un peu éludé, c'est-à-dire le, le piratage aussi de, du système en train de marcher, mais qui peut devenir une arme de, pour la population euh, totalement euh, infantilisante, tellement on est devenu vulnérable. Euh, le clonage de la pensée, par exemple, était quelque chose qui est une arme de destruction massive aussi. Donc... Euh, on a deux, euh, deux aspects là d'armes euh, non nucléaires. Euh, on, les armes plus conventionnelles, on n'en a pas tellement, tellement parlé. Euh, si quelqu'un veut en parler dans la salle, on pourra en parler. Euh, et euh, je crois que la question est ouverte. De, de, euh, maintenant, le, le, la, la parole est à la salle. On aura euh, un, une petite intervention euh, sur l'agent la, sur orange au Vietnam un petit peu plus tard, euh, quand on aura amorcé cette discussion-là. Et puis peut-être aussi, euh, non, celle sur l'uranium appauvri, vous l'avez faite ce matin, donc euh, est, vous estimez que vous n'avez plus besoin de reparler sur l'uranium sur appauvri Il n'y a pas eu de discussion. Hein. Non Seulement l'intervention. Mais cette dernière intervention a été faite, c'est ça Non, bien sûr qu'on peut en discuter, mais l'intervention que vous vouliez faire, vous l'avez faite ce matin. Non Bon. Euh, je vais faire... Et puis, il y a euh, effectivement sur l'arme biologique une petite information que voulait donner euh, le médecin des armées. Donc, euh, on y reviendra. Commençons par la discussion euh, directement à, avec des questions aux intervenants. Sur vos deux interventions, un grand merci. Nous avons beaucoup appris. Euh... Mais je, je suis affolée, je suis euh, euh, vraiment perdue avec toutes ces, ces euh, informations que vous donnez. Et j'ai appris qu'il suffit qu'un homme appuie sur un bouton rouge et nous, nous disparaissons de la planète. Est-ce que vous allez accepter cela So, two questions for Jean Pascal and one for, for Goetz. Uh, I'm going to be a bit provocative. I'm going to ask what was, the, uh, what was the real cause which brought the states together to agree? Because if, if you think of the Iran-Iraq war, for instance, chemical weapons were used and there was no, no much, uh, not many protests about that. So what was the real cause? Was it the military threat? of the US military threat of uh, intervention, because it was very real. Was that the real reason why states convened? Secondly, Jean Pascal, uh, you started with a slide of a timeline. And it made me think about the nuclear weapons. Why? Because um, until, until um, the Second World War, the development with nuclear weapons could have been very similar, the development. There is a famous case called the Shimoda case from 1964, in which Tokyo District Tribunal said that the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were illegal on the basis of the law, which was valid before the uh, uh, 94 uh, conventions and so forth. So the development could have been similar. So why, why it was not? Was it because the uh, chemical weapons were the lesser evil, that it was easier to agree on them? If not, can you find anything in your discourse, the positive discourse, the path, uh, that could be used 
to create openings for a nuclear disarmament discourse. That's a bit difficult in the Pagwar spirit. Uh, thank you. And for Goetz, I have another question. Uh, definitions. Is there really anything going on on interstate level which, uh, which could give some help here? I'm giving you an example. I'm not a cyber specialist, but I do read a lot of cyber material in my real job. So I have noticed that the Russian rhetoric on, uh, on the, the application of international legal norms, especially on the use of force, is different than in the West. They say that the uh, UN Charter cannot be used in the, uh, as a reference in the cyber environment. So is there anything ongoing here that the players, all players, could agree on common definitions? I'd be happy to know. Thank you. Bon, premièrement, je, je vais dire que c'est quand même beaucoup plus euh, compliqué qu'on s'imagine euh, très souvent pour euh, se mener des armes chimiques biologiques et c'est aussi une des raisons pour laquelle on ne l'a pas vu euh, tellement euh, dans l'histoire, même l'histoire euh, récente. Euh, Est-ce que j'ai accepté le bouton rouge Non. Si je l'aurais fait, euh, je travaillerais peut-être pour l'industrie et gagner beaucoup plus d'argent <rire> que maintenant. Um, uh, Katharina, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, wonderful uh, two, two questions. Uh, I think uh, what happened was um, uh, the U.S. was probably reluctantly going to intervene military because, you know, Obama drew his red line. When I heard that, I would say, okay, now we are going to see chemical attacks. That, uh, that was like going to test where the limits were because there were too many interested parties in getting American, French, British uh, military involvement, and they were going to provoke uh, a number of things uh, happening, not necessarily the Syrian government, which is one of the reasons why there's uncertainty. However, uh, two, two things happened. In the United Kingdom, for once, Parliament did its job. It debated intervention and it denied. I mean, it's a late consequence of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, but people were not naive uh, anymore. I remember uh, in 2001, 2002, 2003, I was in many discussions a minority of a single person uh, sitting in meetings arguing against there is no foundation on those grounds for military intervention. So um, Russia was really concerned and the initiative came from Russia and Russia brought up the CWC and the OPCW. So Russia first brought in instruments of international law and secondly uh, it did it in such a way that you know the champion of law could not uh, ignore it uh, in a way. The, there was a second route, but you had to have the instruments in place in the first uh, time. And don't, I'm not going to say that I think that uh, the Russians were like good boys. I mean, they were doing everything to protect uh, the Syrian uh, regime, and they, uh, you know, utilized international law uh, for that purpose. But you know, from a disarmament pr uh, perspective, uh, the, the scenario worked uh, very well under very complicated uh, conditions. Um, for your, your question on uh, nuclear weapons is really a, an interesting one, and uh, I have a theory. The only problem with uh, the theory is uh, I can't produce it because uh, uh, prove it, uh, because there are no other examples. But my theory is that uh, that one sheet of paper that lies in the vaults here in Paris, which is called the Geneva Protocol, is key to the very different developments uh, we've seen, uh, uh, chemical, biological on the one hand, nuclear on the other hand. It's uh, a prohibition on the use. It's not disarmament or arms control because it says nothing about uh, you know, development, production, stockpiling, and so on. And, uh, you know, it's a contract. It, the first line is the high contracting uh, party. So if somebody breaches a contract, it doesn't exist anymore. And then, of course, you could retaliate. But it's a no-use uh, commitment. What it did was 
it delegitimized chemical biological uh, weapons, so it became increasingly difficult to justify it for whatever purposes uh, to use it. And secondly, and this is the most important reason, it gradually pushed chemical weapons, biological, I mean, they were not really being developed then, but uh, chemical weapons to the margins of military doctrine. And this, in my mind, is the reason why we went down the road of disarmament. It's not because they were less useful. It's only uh, because they had started being pushed out. The military didn't really want to use it. With nuclear weapons, that never happened uh, in, in a way. There is no ban on the use of nuclear weapons. You can build many arguments on the basis of uh, you know, uh, humanitarian law, proportionality, non but even the International Court of Justice admitted that if the survival of the state is at stake, you know, they could not rule it as unlawful. There is a residual purpose that legitimizes possession and possible use of nuclear weapons. The Geneva Protocol did exactly the, the opposite thing. The interesting consequence uh, that has happened is that in the chemical and the biological uh, area, when we started moving from the laws of war to the law of disarmament, uh, we got what I've started calling a single integrated treaty system, which is a single document covers all aspects of the weapon. You know, if it's a missile, if it's a bomb, if it's a landmine, uh, if it's a torpedo, if it has a chemical warhead, a uh, biological warhead, it's banned. We don't have to make any distinctions on whatever grounds it is completely prohibited. And all other measures reinforce that norm. In the nuclear area, somehow, uh, the agenda got scattered, and people are always inventing new issue areas to try to make progress, but all the time it's negotiating new treaties, it's ratifying new treaties, you have different memberships, uh, different arguments. What one used in one treaty cannot be used in another one because uh, states started objecting, uh, and so on. And you have that enormous uh, fragmentation, which, and it, you ask me, what is... Uh, a solution? Well, uh, an experiment I'm trying to promote among uh, delegates uh, to the CD is, you know, why not have a couple of countries, uh, like-minded countries, draft something like, you know, the Protocol of Helsinki prohibiting the use of nuclear weapons in war. One page nothing sophisticated, and then invite other countries to join it. Would that work? Well, you know, all the countries that are party to a nuclear weapon-free zone, I think, would sign up immediately. Many European countries would do, quite uh, well, Canada, I can uh, see do, because it doesn't even affect nuclear posture in NATO, you see. Uh, many Asian states would do. Uh, Geneva Protocol has 136 states parties since 1925. I think you would have more than that. And then you st would start having uh, customary law and different types of pressures uh, kicking in, much more than uh, other. Th that's one way uh, I am looking at it. What would be the sanctions in the dialogue? <laughs> uh, well, uh, the, this is a good question. The interesting part is, with regard to biological weapons, the Geneva Protocol was never violated. With regard to uh, chemical weapons, uh, there have been a number of violations, but each time the international community has reacted quite strongly, one way or another. It's not the violation that weakens the norm, it's the failure of having a reaction to the violation uh, that weakens uh, the norm. This is now the concern with the chlorine attacks that the OPCW uh, is not responding uh, to, uh, to that, except for the investigation, but not coming out forcefully. And that's uh, a, di a different issue here. But having the norm there, uh, having the document, you know, that uh, Helsinki Protocol, uh, have it become annually the subject of resolutions in the UN General Assembly, trying to reinforce, uh, uh, calling on states to join it, uh, and so forth. This is the process that started happening with chemical biological weapons from 66 onwards as a consequence of the Vietnam War. Good. Can you answer, Kitai? Yeah, I don't know. I try. <laughs> but first to your question. I mean, if there would be a red button, uh, I think every citizen uh, which can destroy the planet, I mean, every citizen should be called 
to, 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 to prevent that. There's no doubt about it. The question is, uh, uh, who owns the red bottom and what can you do with the red bottom? I think there's, as a scientist, uh, only nuclear weapons which can blow up the whole planet in uh, half an hour, period. I mean, we, until now we have no legal uh, document which prohibits, prohibits uh, the use, uh, not to speak about the possession of nuclear weapons. So. Um, I think um, the question is of, 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 of the re real reasons why, why military gives up uh, specific uh, military options is, is, is of course interesting. Um, uh, Jean Pascal explained it already for the chemical weapon issues. We have other um, uh, domains, uh, laser weapons for blinding uh, is prohibited. And, um, but laser weapons f to be used against satellites, uh, high-power high laser weapons to be used against satellites or against um, other uh, missiles, for example, is not, it's not uh, uh, prohibited. So you see, the military is very often behind it. And I, I think Pascal is right. If it fits to your doctrine, state doctrine and military doctrine, then you will do everything to maintain these kind of, of arsenals. Why the United States is not uh, rational in this sense by apply, applying to things like CTBT, which I think could be easily be signed, you know, because they have such a tremendous uh, uh, advances uh, uh, in, in, in sheer numbers of, of, of nuclear testing. Uh, that, that's really a question we should ask the, uh, you know, the people in the Senate, which try to, to hinder that. The same is for for anti-satellite weapons. I mean, uh, the Outer Space Treaty clearly prohibits um, the deployment of, of weapons of mass destruction in space, which is, I think, a good thing because space is 100 kilometers away, and if you things are circling around you, that could be a different world. So this was prohibited. Unfortunately, uh, it was not prohibited to use conventional weapons. So there is since. 10, 15 years in, in, in very uh, intense debate whether uh, conventional weapons for anti-satellite purposes uh, are already there and they not necessarily have to be brought into space. They can be um, handled also from Earth. And in a sense, you can even use missile defense to, to shoot down satellites. And the Chinese and the, the Americans already showed that, that this is doable. Nevertheless, there is no prohibition of it. So I think the military sees some options here and, and distrusts the others. And um, so let's come to the Russians here uh, and to the cyber issues. You ask for, for international activities. There are a lot of activities going on. The question is, what is the end result of it? I don't know. But uh, it's good to, to, to learn that there are bilateral consultations between US and China. Uh, which are, of course, secret more or less, that the Russians and the Americans uh, signed already an agreement for some kind of red telephone early warning, so red computer for early warning about attacks. But it's interesting to see, if you look to the wording of the Russian, there's a Russian and Chinese proposal for a code of conduct. Uh, in the UN uh, sphere, and uh, it says, you know, um, information weapons should be prohibited and should be controlled by national law. And the West is rejecting that because they see it as a simple tool to switch off Google and, and Apple or whatever uh, is, is in these countries uh, available. And the Russians already, uh, under Putin, made an announcement that they, in the times of crisis, can switch off the Russian parts of the Russian internet. So you see, there is a lot of nervosity, and there are no general principles and, and, and not agreed general principles. And then we have the work of the UN group of governmental experts. Um, the last group came to a conclusion, which is always seen on the UN level as a success, and which tried to identify uh, specific principles. Now we have a new group of governmental experts. And uh, I think uh, the time is not ripe to find you know, the basis of, let's call it a cyber convention or so, something prohibiting things. But on the other side, I agree also with Jean Pascal. States can make unilateral statements that they are not planning to do that. I mean, if they don't do it, why don't they say? that they are not doing it, you know. But there are states which are so big, you know, that they don't do it. And I think these are 
the main troublemakers. And I think I wished the European Union would also be a little bit clearer on these uh, subjects which I'm just proposing, on cyber code of conduct. They are not pushing too much on, the, on, on that issue. And there are voices in Europe who say, yeah, but if the others are uh, developing some kind of new weapons, then we might also have the uh, option to do the same. I think that's the mentality still. And uh, again, this can cause a lot of uh, havoc here. Uh, certainly not comparable with nuclear weapons, uh, but it could uh, undermine the daily uh, service of modern societies. And this is seen for modern societies as a future threat, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah, this is for Mr. Zanders. Uh, if I remember rightly, uh, a few years ago, the Bush administration uh, used the uh, threat of chemical weapons and biological weapons as a pretext to come back on its doctrine of uh, non-first use of nuclear weapons. And uh, so, and I think Chirac afterwards uh, decided that France also could use nuclear weapons as a first use <clears throat> in case of um, chemical warfare or bio biological attacks. Uh, could you tell us where we are with that right now? Because I'm a little bit lost in terms of what are the present doctrines. And uh, as a specialist on chemical warfare, is there a way that you could tell them uh, that they couldn't use that as a pretext <laughs> to change uh, their doctrine? I mean, I don't see why we could say because of the threat of chemical warfare or this or that, we could bomb somebody uh, with nuclear weapons. It's totally you know, outrageous. Thank you. Very uh, briefly uh, to say, yes, this has happened. And it was uh, basically a situation of uh, the sudden end of the Cold War, where you had huge military arsenals all of a sudden searching for a threat. They had to be justified to continue. There were bureaucratic uh, interests. Uh, this has happened uh, immediately, but uh, with uh, basically the disappearance of chemical and biological weapons, I mean, the threats we are talking about today are not the same threats uh, we had during the Cold War, both in terms of the quality of the agents and the volumes, uh, much uh, lower. There is no way, and, and that discussion has uh, kind of uh, disappeared uh, generally uh, from uh, the debate. So people are now looking for different uh, justifications, but it's much, much less uh, the CBW area. It's uh, also a, a consequence, you know, uh, of the use of that term weapon of mass destruction, where uh, people deliberately used a very vague uh, concept to put uh, dangers and risks from chemical and biological weapons on a similar level as uh, those of nuclear weapons, while at the same time suggesting that nuclear weapons could be acquired as easily as chemical or biological weapons. So that was a debate which fortunately has kind of uh, disappeared uh, now. Thank you for your uh, excellent speech. And I have a question about the cyber war warfare. Uh, as a professor, you mentioned that armed conflict will migrate from land to cyber space. And uh, in your point of view, will cyber war replace the main role that armed conflict plays? And uh, because nowadays, we can still say around the whole world, there are hot wars, like what happens in Iraq. So if we can understand this question as there are different fronts that countries fight, and none of them will disappear. Uh, and it is not the question of transformer, but uh, diversity of, uh, of conflicts. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it's, it's not easy to, to, to answer that, but I uh, think uh, that the idea that the con conflict of mankind uh, is transformed to the cyber arena is po poorly science fiction. It's poorly science fiction. Uh, we will see different forms, and I think you are right. Diversity is the right uh, word here. We see, we see illiterated, illiterated uh, uh, fighters uh, easily. You know, people who even don't understand, have, have a uh, religious ideological orientation, and they use AK-47 and some heavy weapons, and they are using handies. 
Uh, but on the other side, we see Western forces which are using drones, uh, which is, are perceived, let's say, by Pakistanis as some, some kind of god-like thing which executes people. So you are right. I mean, uh, technology is not is not easing this in situation, uh, uh, but it makes things more and more complicated. It, it, it adds to the clash of different cultures. And um, sometimes it, it might be useful. I mean, collateral damage uh, is certainly uh, uh, decreasing, but only on the side of the one who has these kind of weapons. And it's clear that uh, opponents, antagonists, are using different weapons. So the, the notion that war uh, uh, is a technical computer game is totally nonsense. And uh, I think as a German you can understand that I'm always referring to Karl von Clausewitz, which is not very well understood by the Americans uh, very often because it explains very much that it, it's a political concept which then also uses military force to compel the antagonist to fulfill your will. And that's still, still the case. So war has not shaped so much, the tools have changed. And I think my argument was to, to do not allow science fiction arguments by, uh, by promising that wars could be, or let's say conflicts, could be uh, e much easy, more easy uh, solved than, uh, uh, than by, by diplomacy and by goodwill to understand the other side. I mean, that's, that's the message in short. D'abord, vous remerciez, Monsieur le Président, et vous remerciez tous. Je sais que dans la salle, vous êtes à 100%. Euh, vous soutenez le combat des victimes vietnamiennes de l'agent Orange. Euh, je m'appelle Yuma et je représente l'association dont euh, Madame Gendreau a parlé ce matin. Évidemment, c'est difficile euh, de combattre la puissance d'un État comme les États-Unis. Mais vous savez que le peuple vietnamien est patient. Et il arrivera, il arrivera à tout bout de champ. D'abord, pourquoi Parce que ça a été démontré que la dioxine est un produit qui tue, et qui tue sciemment. Et les États-Unis ont toujours menti. Donc on est arrivé scientifiquement à le démontrer que c'est une arme biochimique, chimique, et c'est une arme nucléaire. Pourquoi Parce que c'est utilisé sur des civils. C'est simple, nous avons appris cela. Et la deuxième chose que nous avons appris, c'est qu'avec vous, la paix de la communauté internationale, nous y arriverons. Pourquoi Les juristes démocrates, en 2009, à Paris, suite à, au procès qui ont été... <rire> Comment on appelle ça Débuté. Euh, Débuté. Une, oui. Et, et ont pris euh, le relais. Et il a été démontré qu'il y a une loi qui s'appelle pollueur-payeur. Il n'y a rien. Vous venez, vous jetez un produit dans le jardin de votre voisin, ça tout détruit, vous devez payer. Ce qui est arrivé en 1984 au Nicaragua. Ce cas-là, C'est fini. Et les Vietnamiens ont un problème terrible. C'est que les États-Unis d'Amérique ont dit si vous, venez, si vous voulez qu'on joue avec vous, oubliez tout ça. Et c'est une question politique. Or, nous, les victimes, 3 millions de victimes, et nous sommes à la troisième et quatrième génération à subir, on refuse cela. Pourquoi Parce qu'on a le droit avec nous, et vous êtes là pour nous appuyer. La deuxième chose, c'est qu'on a, dé, a dénoncé l'impunité des États-Unis au dernier euh, Assemblée générale et congrès international des, ju des juristes démocrates à Bruxelles. On l'a dit, et tout le monde nous a appuyés. Alors, que dire de plus Nous avons appris qu'un individu, une victime, peut prendre la cause de tous les victimes. Et il se trouve que cette chance a été donnée à Mme Tong Trunga. Elle, c'est une victime de l'agent Orange. Elle est française. Et on a lancé le problème sur le territoire français. Là, je ne peux rien vous dire, mais vous pouvez suivre euh, sur les, euh, le net 
et je vous ai mis un papier pour résumer. Alors, il y a en France, en Europe, une pétition qui s'appelle « N écocide now ». C'est vrai, il faut terminer cet écocide. Si ça se passe au Vietnam, ça se passe ailleurs, comme vous avez vu. Euh, le problème de l'uranium appauvri, c'est un autre débat qu'il faut qu'on fonde, c'est qu'on aide ces gens-là. Et pourquoi Parce que Ebola est là aussi. Vous voyez, tout ça s'enchaîne. Et nous venons de voir deux très intéressantes euh, présentations de ce qu'un homme peut faire et appuyer sur euh, un bouton rouge. C'est vrai que nous sommes dans un colloque des scientifiques. Et j'ai la confiance absolue aux scientifiques. En 1991, le professeur Edgar Lettrer, le seul unique biochimiste qui avait réuni tous les prix Nobel à Orsay, s'arrêtait le largage de l'agent orange au Vietnam en 1971. 2009, comme on a fait ce procès sur un terrain national, bien sûr, mais le peuple français est celui qui défend ardemment tous les gens qui sont dénués et qui sont dans ce cas-là. Alors, maintenant, nous avons confiance en vous et j'ai confiance que ce colloque, parce que vous êtes en majorité des scientifiques, et quand les scientifiques se réveillent, la planète se réveille et donne une solution. Merci. Écoutez, je me présente, je suis un ancien chirurgien des armées. J'ai servi une vingtaine d'années en Afrique, en Afrique noire, dans des contextes de guerre, de révolution, mais surtout de santé publique. Et je suis au cœur de l'école du Pharo, qui sont des experts internationalement reconnus en matière de médecine tropicale. Il lance un, un cri, il lance, et c'est ce cri que je voudrais relayer ici. J'ai été surpris dans un colloque récent à Marseille, des 20e actualités et du Pharo, d'entendre les experts de l'OMS soulever la question, bien entendu sans y répondre, dans l'épidémie qu'on devrait presque appeler aujourd'hui une pandémie d'Ebola en Afrique de l'Ouest, de prononcer le mot avec un point d'interrogation, même plusieurs points d'interrogation, de bioterrorisme. La question n'est pas éludée, mais elle doit être posée, car lorsqu'un pays a été capable pendant dix ans, car nous entendions à l'époque parler entre 1960 et 1970 des pandages de défoliants et personne n'y faisait attention, on n'imaginait pas l'horreur, l'horreur qui reste et qui restera peut-être très longtemps pour la population vietnamienne, pour les soldats vétérans américains qui en ont été victimes et pour beaucoup d'autres. Par conséquent, je voulais simplement alerter votre assemblée qui est celle de scientifiques qui réfléchissent. Il ne faut pas que nous passions à côté de la gravité d'un phénomène viral, peut-être même avec des virus mutants, qui jusqu'à maintenant, depuis le mois de janvier dernier, et ça a commencé à s'aggraver en, en juin, avec seulement Médecins sans frontières, maintenant il y a des Marocains, il y a des Cubains, et Médecins sans frontières devant l'Assemblée Générale de l'ONU, a porté un appel en, en s'étonnant de l'inertie, de l'incapacité de la communauté internationale à agir. Nous avons, vous le verrez sur vos tables, nous les anciens médecins des armées, lancé un appel à madame la présidente de la Commission de la Défense Nationale. Elle est sans réponse, mais c'est cette question que je voulais poser. Merci, monsieur le Président.